standing by. Right, good afternoon again everybody and welcome especially to the two schools joining us today, North Londonderry and oh there's an elephant. Um, I've forgotten the other one. Uh, something are Newland Elementary Schools, 8 to 10 years old you all are and it's wonderful to have you with us. It is World Endangered Species Day and what we're going to be doing is making some clay animals to start with. My name is James Hendry and on camera, on camera today is Fergus and you may see all sorts of other people with us. What we have is Herbert on the front there. Herbert is going to be tracking for the walking team. The walking team is just joining us though to start with to come down and make our animals. And the first thing we'll show you is this beautiful elephant. There he is. He's a young bull and although they're not strictly described as endangered. There are fewer and fewer of them every single year. So we have to look after them very carefully indeed. And I know that one of you or is going to or some of you are going to be making some clay animals as well. You can ask us any questions you like and you just ask your teacher. She will then Skype through to our final control where Louise is sitting and Louise will ask me your questions and we will do our best to answer them. Tristan is going to be walking today, Jamie is going to be on the other vehicle but at the beginning of the drive we're all going to be making some clay endangered animals and I think that I probably have to help you guess what mine is. One because it is an unusual animal and two because I am a very very bad artist. I'm sure there are lots of you who are much better than me. Isn't that beautiful? All right, let's carry on from here. We'll come back to him a little bit later. What we're going to do now is just go on towards the pan and Herbert, who's sitting on the front there, says he's going to make an elephant for you. That should be quite interesting. I'm sure Herbert's elephant will be much better than my pangolin. Now, Jamie's just up ahead of us and she's going to be getting off the car shortly with the mud. Let's go and say hello to her. I am going to be getting off the car very shortly, but I thought that before I did that, we'd better do some quick introductions. So hello to all of the schools joining us. My name is Jamie, and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me. And of course, as always, a welcome to our regular viewers as well. I've already explained a little bit about what we're going to do, and I'm sure James has as well. But we are going to be having a little bit of an arts and crafts session this afternoon, because today is Endangered Species Day. And and James is slowly but surely on his way towards us. But for all of our regular viewers, um, perhaps you'd like to send through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter for after the school drive, what endangered species you'd like to see today. Please don't say polar bear, we can't do that. Okay, and there goes Herbie. Herbie's up and off, off the car. There's Herbie, he's giving us a big wave. And there's the pan that we're going to be building our well, whatever we're going to be doing. And we've moved slightly further away from where the elephant was. We weren't really planning on an elephant, but I think that probably we should have. Okay, James, are you ready for this? I'm ready. <laughs> he says he's ready, he's singing. Singing away. Okay, are we going to tell what we're going to make, or are we going to... We're going to get people to guess. Brilliant, okay. Here we go. James is getting a head start. I'm going to wait patiently for James. Now, James, kids, James is very, very good at art, so we should expect great things from whatever statue James makes. And I assume that Herbie is participating as well. Herbie, are you helping James or making your own? I'm making my own. Making your own. Good. Good stuff. And then. I guess we should probably introduce you to the third member of our team since this is how it's playing out this afternoon. Yes, good afternoon everybody. My name is Tristan and on camera I've got Sebastian who's just rigging up 
before our bushwalk this morning. <laughs> Wait, afternoon. It is the afternoon. <laughs> and there's Fergus at the back. The whole team's come We're together. All, yeah. Let's get the only started. poor person who's not on camera is Craig. Camera, <laughs> camera. Craig is busy directing the camera. Right. Can I jump off then, Lou? Tristan will be the only one with an ability to communicate with final control, but off we go. We're going to build some statues. Does it smell? No Okay, yeah, I need some wait, I might go that side. Okay. Yeah, it would dry it out a bit. Yeah, mine's... You have to do this relatively quickly or this is going to be... This is going to be a big mess. <laughs> <laughs> My mud's not sticking. We're all going to end up with balls of mud. This is not quite as pliable as I thought it might be. <laughs> You did choose the trickiest animal. I know, why? Why did you let me do me? Also because my animal needs to be slim. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe what are you doing? Because I feel like you're big and bulky. Well, might be. I feel like Herbie's already way ahead here. I feel like Herbie's gonna be the winner. Well, we probably all knew that to start. Oh no. <laughs> I'm battling full stop. I might need to come to that mud. Oh dear. Right, here we go. Okay, I've got a head. Yes. Just you dry over there. Don't go anywhere. Alright. There we go. Right. So we are trying to mold our little animals. I think Herbie at this stage is definitely... Oh no, I've got tail f just fell off. That's not gone well at all. Things have gone... No, no it's not, James. And I think I've made a fatal error and gotten the wet clay, which is... So Kyle would like to know, has any of us ever discovered a new animal? Um, Anyone? No, I have never discovered a new animal. No, me, me neither. You know, Kai, can, you, can Kai hear me? Kyle. Kyle. Can yes, you I'll come closer. Hold on, James. Kyle, <laughs> this is going we to look very odd. We have all found many things that probably haven't been described, and those are many of the insects that we have found. Uh, could possibly have not ever been given a name because there's so many different kinds of insects that have never been given a name. So although I'm sure you're thinking of something like a mammal, uh, yes, we could easily have found uh, a few animals that have never been described before. So Ian wants to know what the most endangered species that we get here is. Thoughts? I think the most endangered species that we get here might be what I'm building. Yes, I think actually... <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be a fish of the body. <laughs> it's very good, James. Well done. It's, 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 it's it, needs to, it needs to dry a little bit. I feel like once it dries, it's going to, it's going to feel... Yes. We almost need a skeleton. Structurally, structural integrity. What about a skeleton, James? Like, I feel like... Skeleton's not a bad idea. I feel like a bit of maybe a stick or something in amongst everything. Well, I, f I feel like Herbie may have done this before. 
Looks like Herbie may have been doing it for his life. Yes, and that's... <laughs> they want to know if you're making a sea cucumber, Herbie. <laughs> Herbie, are you making a sea cucumber? <laughs> no. No, what are you making, Herbie? An elephant. Or a sea cucumber. Maybe. Or we, do we have to wait and see? Okay. I'm going for a little clay light effect at this stage. Now for those of you who don't know what clay light is, here in South Africa when we were naughty little boys, what we used to do is we used to get a stick and used to find clay like this and you would put it on the end of the stick and then you would throw it at each other. And it used to come off with quite a bit of force and it was actually quite painful to be hit. Did you ever play James? No, 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 I was from the city. <laughs> city boys don't do such things. Okay. Yes, I have been So Skylar, elephants like to play in the mud because it's good for their skin. It's like a, going for a bath for us and where you wash yourself and you get rid of all the dirt and things like that. I know it sounds very funny and that they play in the mud to make themselves cleaner, but it basically gets rid of all the parasites that they have on them. So they pick up little things like ticks and mites and all other kinds of parasites that stick to them and try and feed off their blood. And so when they go and rub up in the mud, it gets stuck to their skin and then they go and rub onto a tree and they can get rid of all of those parasites. So that's why they go into the mud. They're very clever animals. It's not like us. We use all kinds of other things to get rid of our parasites, don't we, James? Yes, yes. Many kinds of hair products. <laughs> I was about to say, James, have you had any experience with hair products or not so much? I did try to use hair products once when I was going bald in the attempt to oh. not go bald. But unfortunately, that did not work. Did it not work? No. I'm sorry, James. Unfortunately, it did not work. Oh. I continued to go bald. That feels like this could be. I've got eyes for mine already. Declan, I'm not sure how big a giant beetle would be. You're wondering, how, have I ever seen a giant beetle? Well, we do get quite large beetles out here, don't we, James? We get very, very big beetles called longhorn beetles, click beetles, maybe like James's larval beetle that he's building over yeah, there. I'm, I'm, building a I'm building a dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> it almost looks a bit crocodile-like. A crocodile on a sad day. <laughs> You're, you've got proper clay there. Yes, how did he make it? I don't, I'm, I'm fascinated by Herbert's ability to make clay. But getting back to the giant beetle, we get big dung beetles as well. So they're about, the, some of them, almost the size of my palm. My palm is now very dirty, so please excuse that. But some of our beetles will easily be as long as this, with legs coming off and big sort of formations on their head. We even get one called a rhino beetle. Now the rhino beetle is called that because it's got these big sort of protrusions off its face that look just like a rhino. So those are pretty cool as well, and they get really large. What other large beetles do we get? Um, giant ground beetles. Giant ground beetles. Giant click beetle. Giant click beetle. That's another big one. Goliath. Goliath beetle. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Herbert is finished, everybody. Herbert is laughing. <laughs> Herbert is finished and he's done very, very well. Lou, I would love to ask you to say that again, but I can't double click on my radio with my hand, so please can you just ask that question again for me, please? This is a disaster. I'm nearly so, Annie, you're wondering how elephants stay warm without a fur coat. Well, the temperatures here in Africa are quite warm. This afternoon it's about, what was it this afternoon, Jen? 20, 79 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite warm this afternoon. So it's very seldom that it gets too cold for the elephants. And remember, they've got thick skin on their body, and so they're able to stay warm like that. Now, Seb, stop looking at my things because they're not ready yet. You have to wait until I'm I'm at a point where I can show you what is going on. Because now I've found what I'm looking for. I've found the right clay. Jamie, how are you doing that side? You're very quiet, which worries me. Yes. <laughs> Don't worry, Jamie. You are far better off than what I am currently. Yeah, I see you've built a blob. <laughs> it's a sea slug as well. Sea slug. It's a sea slug. Isn't there an endangered species of slug that we could just go for? No, but can yeah. we all make one? Yes. It's been a disaster. I have to start again. I know, as well. 
Jamie, there are many questions as to what that could actually be. Now I'm trying to cover some grass. Herbert's is even having a meal. <laughs> That's how far ahead he is, James, and I suppose we shouldn't laugh because we should all be in that same... Is about to take its first steps. Ooh, two minutes. That's a bit of a rush, I two think. Two minutes? <laughs> I was planning on being here for the whole drive. <laughs> oh, this has all gone pear-shaped. I think I'm going to win this contest. I think I have a chance to come second. I, I definitely think so because I'm definitely not going to win, James. That's that is a. If I come second in this art contest, my mother will be so proud of me. I have. Oh dear! Hang on, the eye's fallen now. I retire from this competition because it's not gone well. No, no, no retiring, you've got to submit your artwork. The there we go. I just need to do a bit of drawing on mine. Look down, I'm Jed. Thank you, thank you, Happy. I'm not entirely sure mine is even vaguely recognizable as an animal wife. Yeah, how, do, how does mine look? How are you new in elementary years? Got some guesses. Oh no, Jamie, what has gone on there? Oh no. That's the guesses for the animals that we've built. Right, good. Yes? An elephant? An elephant, correct. A duck? Which I think must no, be mine is not a duck. What's yours, James? What are the other ones? Do I have now. Look at mine, James mine is brilliant. <laughs> I'm taking my. Herbert's obviously is the winner. Mine's head fell off. Oh dear. This is not a duck. That is not definitely not a duck. An anteater, yes, there's somebody. It is an anteater. An anteater. Who said that? You're a genius. You can be my best friend for the whole day if you want to be. Uh, it is something <laughs> called a pangolin. And a pangolin, of course, a very deeply endangered animal, and it does eat ants. It is an anteater of sorts. And that's exactly what mine is. And it's about. Well, if I let it look at you like that, it's about that big. You see one? Well, a little bit bigger, actually. And it's got scales like an armadillo. You all know what an armadillo is. And it's got scales like an armadillo. I'm just going to put it next to Jamie to make her inspired, a.k.a. jealous. Oh, yes, I am. I'm very jealous. I feel yeah. like, James, you may have... So maybe you still got one that's eating. Hey, but what do you mean now? A snake. Okay. I feel like mine might not stand, but we're going to try anyway. And I've done a little one because I was a bit rushed for time. So, Manya wants to know if there's any turtles that are endangered. Well, here in South Africa, I'm not sure we do have, do we, James? Well, I think some of our sea turtles. Yes, yeah, sea turtles, but not here on land, I don't think. But I'll see turtles most definitely. So I think we've got the leather. What's it, leatherback? Is it? I think the leatherback. Is yes. The and the loggerhead turtle. Yes. The olive. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. There we go. I think we're all done. Okay. Let's. There we go. There's my contribution. Oh no! It's breaking. You guys have to look after my wild dog because. So I tried to build a wild dog, but he's broken in half. I'm going to have to do some mending work on this. But a wild dog is one of our most endangered predators that we have here. And so I don't think I'm going to actually be able to carry it on our bushwalk. So I think we might have to ask Jamie to look after it. Jamie, if you break my wild dog, you are in lots of trouble. Okay, I'll... But there you go. This isn't going anywhere. <laughs> this was meant to be a rhinoceros, and its best side is probably there. <laughs> But it's not bad. You got the shape of the head well done. That was very good. The head just fell off. 
I know, but it's. I know, but the shape is good, Jamie. Well done. All right, guys. I think that's it. I think it's time to carry on and actually do something constructive for this afternoon. Enough arts and crafts. We've now seen that none of us are in any way talented in sculpture, other than Herbie. Herbie is definitely the one that we need to watch out for. And this is actually not even cleaning my hands one bit either. I'm just making a mess. All right, you two. I shall bid you a farewell. I'll see you later. Thank you. Don't forget my wild dog behind. <laughs> right, Herbie, let's go. Let's go find some animals. Okay, everybody, now it's time to actually do some proper safari and see if we can't find anything interesting. Now, on the bushwalk, when we're out here, we're going to go and start looking for all the little animals. So we can look for insects and we're going to look for varying other little species of things and maybe if we're lucky we might bump into a big animal now i know the elephants are not too far away so i'm sure james or jamie might head in that direction and they might go and try and see if they can't find those ellies to show all of you in the meantime we're going to go see if we can't find some lions and cubs we had a report that there was some lions around so we're going to head in that area so, Danny, you're wondering what my favorite species of beetle is and why. Mm, this is an interesting one. I have two favorites. I have the, the dung beetle, which I know sounds very odd because it rolls around balls of dung and it plays in other animals' poo, but it's a very, very clever beetle. It's able to use the stars to navigate, so it can climb up onto its ball at night and be able to navigate its way around, which is very, very clever. So that's that one. And then there's another one called a regal um, fruit chafer. Now, the regal fruit chafer, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of all this mud. So a bit of dry elephant dung works quite well. Um, the regal fruit chafer is probably one of the most beautiful insects. It's bright, bright green with oranges and whites, and it really is very, very pretty. So it is one of those animals, that, or one of those insects that you really want to see. And they're quite big. They're about this size as well, and very, very, very cool insects. So those are one of my favorites. Seb, do you have a favorite beetle? Uh, yeah. What do you have? Goliath. Goliath beetle. Yes, they are very nice as well. Very big. As we were talking about earlier, we are talking about giant bugs and beetles. And the Goliath beetle is definitely one of those. Now, when we're doing bushwalk, it's always important to remember that we have to take into consideration all of the factors around us because all the animals out here, while they are used to the vehicles, they're not particularly used to us on foot and they can be quite dangerous. So when we're walking, we always got to make sure that the wind is generally blowing towards us and we're walking towards the wind so that if there's any animal in front of us, they don't smell us before we see them and we have to walk nice and quietly. So we're going to sneak away from all the noise that James and Jamie is making. And while we do that, let's go off to Jamie and see what she's going to do for the rest of the afternoon. I'm making lots of noise. I'm not ready. I'm just driving along and going back to where we had that elephant in the hope that my terrible, terrible rhino statue didn't scare it away. That was a really terrible rhino statue and then its head fell off when I tried to move it. I'm devastated and I've left it behind because... Oh, there we go. How convenient. Thank you, boy. I left it behind because it wasn't a very good statue at all. There's our elephant. We didn't scare him away with all of our noise and talking and laughing. Oh, Joseph, we can't see his face at the moment, but you want to know, well, why do elephants have a the answer to that is a couple of reasons. For the males, they use them to fight each other over the females in a herd. And for the females, as, and as well as the males, they can use them for defense, for fighting off predators. And then for digging up various things out of the ground or on a tree. So elephants eat tree bark, they also eat leaves, they eat branches, and they'll use their tusks to dig into the tree bark and then strip it away using their trunks. Now uh, here's a fun fact about an elephant's tusks. Most of them use one tusk over the other. You know like human beings use one, your, either your right hand or your left hand, Elephants are exactly the same with their tusks. And come, I'll show you. Let's see if we can figure out which tusk this elephant uses more often. Because what happens is, because they use them to dig and to scrape on bark, one of them gets worn down more quickly than the other. And you can actually see whether an elephant is left or right-handed. Now let's see if we can figure this elephant out, if he's left or right-handed. 
There he is. Now, Brendan, you would like to know how big is an elephant? Brendan, um, well, potentially a very big elephant could be up to three meters at the shoulder, possibly even taller, so that's over nine feet, and can weigh anywhere between five to ten tons in the case of a really, really, really big elephant. That is over... 20,000 pounds potentially. So an elephant is a very large animal. It's the largest land mammal on planet Earth. There we go. Look at his tusks. Can you see that the one on the right looks slightly, slightly, slightly sharper? Now he's hiding the one on the left. The one on the left is a little bit more rounded. And sometimes you get elephants that use both tusks equally. But in this case, I think that this elephant uses his left tusk more than his right tusk. Because his left tusk has been rubbed clean at the end and it looks more worn down. Now, Elizabeth, you would like to know if elephants eat plants and fish. They only eat plants, Elizabeth. They are pure herbivores, which means that this big bull elephant has to walk around constantly because he is so big, feeding himself. And he'll do that on grass and leaves and bark and tubers, anything that he can dig up out of the ground. So that means that they are herbivores only. So they only eat plants, they definitely don't eat fish. And I'm not sure an elephant could catch a fish. I think it would be really very difficult for an elephant to catch a fish. Even if he tried to grab it with his trunk, he wouldn't be quick enough to catch a fish. And their teeth, they don't have any sharp teeth like things that eat fish, like otters. They have blunt molars. Now, Christopher, you want to know why do elephants use their trunks to drink water? And they do. They suck up the water into their trunk and then they move it into their mouths. And Christopher, they do that because otherwise their mouth is so high off the ground when it comes time to drink they'd actually have to climb right down onto their elbows so they'd have to lean down on their elbows to get their mouth anywhere near the water and they can do that but it makes far more sense not to have to use all of that energy and just to reach their trunks down because their trunk can stretch outwards and to suck up the water through the trunk and then to transfer it into their mouths Here you go. He's been such a patient boy. He didn't disappear while we were busy being silly and building statues out of mud. But he is slowly but surely going to move off. Let's try for one last good view of him before he disappears. Now he's a male. This is a male elephant, which means that he's all on his own for now. But Italia, you want to know how do you tell the difference between male and female elephants? Behavior is one thing, because once an elephant is kicked out of his herd, he'll either be on his own or he'll be with a group of males, not all together with the babies, although that's difficult because sometimes the boys come to visit the girls in the herd. So Italia, the best way is to look at an elephant's forehead. So uh, in the male elephants, they've got quite a round forehead. From where that little bump is on the top of his head, it's kind of round all the way down to his trunk. Whereas in females, it's quite angular. So it makes almost like a triangle. And I'll have to try and draw that for you because it's difficult to imagine if you don't know elephants too well. And then the other way is to look between their back legs. And in the male elephants, you can see there's a penis sheath that sticks out in a sort of a V between their back legs. And then female elephants have quite big mammary glands between their front legs. So they look bigger than the males do. That's where they feed their babies from. Right. Our elephant is slowly but surely disappearing. And I think it's time to go over to our special guest artist. Yes, everybody, the special guest creator of the pangolin. And that there is the pangolin on the front of my car, and there shall it remain for the rest of the day. But slightly more entertaining than my pangolin is those beautiful pigs there. Look at the warthogs. 
Milo, you're interested in how often pangolins have babies. And you know, Milo, I actually can't tell you that question because I don't know. And I don't know because we see them so seldom, we hardly ever see pangolins. So I'll tell you what, I'll look it up for you. Because people have done quite a lot of research on pangolins in this area. Let's see. Now its full name is a ground pangolin. And Olivia, you say, was that water hole one that, that, that animals actually use? Yes, absolutely. And isn't it amazing that they can drink such disgusting water and that they're able somehow not to get sick from doing that? Right, I'm reading here quickly from my little uh, special app that I have on my telephone. Well, it says here the gestation period. Okay, so that's how that's how long the baby is in mo in the mother's tummy. It says here that the gestation period is 139 days, which if we divide by 30 takes us. Right, that's quite a long time, actually, isn't it? How much long is that? Divide by 30 with three months, four months. That's almost almost five months. Gee, that's quite. So that's how long it, and for a small animal like a, a pangolin, that's very interesting. Then I will tell you, I don't think that anybody has managed to figure out how often they have babies. I'm just quickly looking here. Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't know that anyone's managed to figure it out. No, looks like not. I would suspect with a gestation period like that, I think you'll probably find that they are able to have one, probably, oh, I, uh, I'm going to say about once every two years. You know, they're not common, they're endangered, obviously, but they're not endangered because they don't breed properly. They're endangered because people have used them and they use their scales. They've got these scales on their backs. And those scales on the back are used in traditional medicines, a little bit like rhino horn is used in traditional medicines. It has no value at all. Those scales are made of the same stuff as your nails are made of. Can you imagine chewing your nails if you felt sick? You'd just feel sicker, wouldn't you? So that's why they are endangered. But in this area called the Sabi Sand, which is part of the Great Kruger National Park, we do have some pangolins, but we don't see them very often. We do see their tracks, and we see where they live and where they've been digging, and we find their dung from time to time, but there are not many of them here. Now, we're going to probably leave these warthogs and head down to a water hole and see if we can't find something coming down to drink on this hot day, but I believe that Tristan has got something even older than me. Indeed we do, James. A lot older than you, but not because it wanted to be, because unfortunately this poor buffalo had died last year because of the drought that we had. So we had very, very little rain last year, which meant that there was no grass whatsoever, and a buffalo is a grass eater. And so unfortunately, where there was no food, got weaker and weaker and weaker, and eventually this buffalo then passed away. Now interestingly enough, if this had been a buffalo that had died now, with all the predators and scavengers that we have around, like vultures and hyenas and lion and leopard these would all be gone the hyenas would have come in and eat most of this but but because of the time that they died there were so many d dead animals and dead buffalo that the vultures and the hyenas couldn't actually eat everything and so there's still bones that are here very very close together but the skull we know it's a baby buffalo because if we have a look here you can see its horns are very very small okay so a big buffalo bull would have a much bigger skull and its horns would almost be about this wide so they would be really really big they'd be over 40 inches from the middle to the curve of the horn and the horns interestingly enough will change shape so you see here they're quite straight but as they get older the horn will start to change and it will go out like this and then it will come and curl up and it will look very 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 different now you can see there's also a nice 
sort of example of the difference between horns and antlers. So a lot of you may know the antlers on the deer that you get at home or any of those elk, moose, those kind of animals, they grow antlers. Now antlers is cartilage that grows from the head and then falls off every year. But you can see with the horns, I'm going to take that away, that the horns are solid bone. It's part of the skull and they grow from the skull itself and it grows throughout its life. Once this horn breaks, that will no longer grow. So they won't get any more, another horn if it breaks. It's not like a deer that has the antlers. Now, you see that there is this little sheath here. This is also from the horn itself. Now this is the same as your fingernails, which is very, very interesting because there's only one animal out here that can eat it. Now if we have a look there, you see there's a little hole? Now that would have been caused by a type of moth. And the moth lays its larvae on here, and as the larvae eats, it'll feed off this keratin, which is what this is called, and it will slowly but surely consume. And as it eats the keratin, it will secrete a little bit of its dung, and mix it with silk and it will make a little tube and then it will grow and grow and grow and eventually over time it will be able to eat this entire horn and there'll be nothing left which is really amazing. Now we've got something dead but James has got very, something very much alive. We have the pigs though have just got a big fright and they've got a big fright because the warthogs have been shot. not the warthogs, the impala, have been shouting at each other. Look over there to the left hand side. You might be able to hear the impala going <laughs> and they're just you know, alarm calling at something, but that means, that, well, often that means that they've seen a predator. But sometimes, especially at this time of the year, it means that the males have seen each other and they don't like each other. And Tristan, you're wondering if warthogs have any predators. Well, that's a very good question, Tristan. They do have predators, but even though they look like delicious pork meals, they're quite difficult to kill. And so the only thing really that is able to take an adult warthog would be a very big male leopard or a lion, and sometimes a hyena as well, or many hyenas. Now, these little piglets, however, they would be easy to catch for something like a lion. And that's one of the reasons that warthogs live inside burrows. They sleep inside termite mounds. And that helps to protect them from the cold, but also from being eaten by lions. But they have to be careful because lions will sometimes try to dig them out of their burrows if they're really hungry. So sometimes, and it seems a very strange thing to do, but what a pig will do or a warthog will do is come speeding out of its burrow if a lion comes towards it and then just run away because they don't want the lions to try and dig them out. Now, Narian and Zakaira, that's a very good question because it goes back to exactly what I was saying there about how difficult it is for predators to catch warthogs. You say, how big can they get? Well, a big male warthog can weigh up to 100 kilograms. That's 220 pounds. So that's a huge amount, and that, of course, makes it extremely, extremely difficult for something like a lion or a leopard to grab. Because even though, well, a lion is much bigger than that, but a leopard is not. And in fact, it's much heavier than the leopards that we get out here. But that, you're looking there at a warthog sow, so that's a, a female, and she probably weighs about half of that. I reckon she probably weighs about 50 kilograms or 110 pounds. Now, Mrs. H, you're wondering about whether or not both the male or and females have tusks. They do, absolutely. That is a female there that you're looking at. And they both have tusks, and they both have those tusks for similar reasons. But, of course, in the male, they are used to fight each other as well as defend themselves. But in the female, that's used to defend itself. Jayla, you say a warthog's poisonous. 
No, Jailer, warthogs are not poisonous at all. I don't know if you mean venomous or you mean poisonous. By poisonous, you would, you're would you actually asking me, are they? can you not eat them? Would they poison you if you ate them? Uh, they're actually delicious to eat, so no, you, you can't. They're um, perfectly edible. They're not poisonous at all. They're also not venomous like a snake. Maybe you're thinking like a snake. If they bit you with those tusks, would they be venomous? Uh, would they, you know, put some poison in your blood? Uh, no, they wouldn't. They are not venomous or poisonous at all. In fact, there are no mammals that are poisonous or venomous. That said, I don't know if you know this or not, but a human bite, so if you bite your friend, and don't go and bite your friend, please, but a human bite is actually quite venomous because our teeth of them and our mouths are very dirty. So if you bite somebody and you break the skin, it can do a lot of damage, probably almost as much as a warthog could do. A warthog will be physically more dangerous because it's much faster and much stronger and its teeth are much sharper, but our bites are very dirty. It's quite amazing to think about, actually. And Daniel, you want to know how long the baby warthogs stay with their mummies. Well, you'll find that the females will probably stay for maybe up to two years or so. I think you'll find after that they drift off and they start to breed. The males become uh, sexually mature probably at about a year and a half or so. And that means that once they are ready to have their own families, they go off. And sometimes they have, you know, sometimes the, the groups are quite big, sometimes up to sort of ten pigs at a time. But the males often go off on their own. All righty, Tristan is now going to tell you another story about that very sad but wise-looking old creature. Indeed we are, and it's a perfect opportunity to have a look at the teeth of a buffalo, because out here, all of these animals, and in particular the buffalo, are very dangerous, and you don't want to go and put your hand down their mouth and ask them to say, ah, like a dentist, for you to be able to see their teeth. So it's a nice chance to have a look at the dental structure of this particular animal. Now we can see here, these are all the molars of the buffalo, and look at them, you, you would think that an animal that eats grass would have flat teeth to grind but actually their teeth are quite sort of rigid and they've got little sort of sharp pieces on them and the reason why is so that they can chew their food and cut it up into tiny 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 little bits and you can actually see between the teeth you see over here there is actually little bits of grass that are stuck there from when this animal was still eating grass and that's how small the grass goes and it can then digest every little bit of nutrients and during that drought that would have been important for this buffalo to be able to get all the food it needed to survive. So Josh, you're wondering how long it takes for the dead animal's body to dissolve. Well, it depends, Josh, on the time of the year and because in the summer months, it's much quicker. The reason why is because in summer there is a lot of insects and so the beetles and insects will also help in breaking down all of the meat and all of the skin and get rid of that. Also, because of last year's drought, when there was too many animals that were dead, the vultures and the hyenas couldn't eat enough and so a lot of these carcasses took much longer to dissolve. But if we had to have this buffalo die right now, you'd find that vultures and hyenas would probably arrive arrived already this evening or tomorrow morning and they would start feeding on it straight away and within I would say probably about six months there would not be anything left here there wouldn't even be a skull or anything like what we see now the only reason we're seeing this now is because the hyenas didn't get into this before it was um, while it was still fresh so that's why it's different but we do have lots of dead things but we also have things that are alive on our skull so I'm going to try and show you Seb can you see it is it gone there or is it still there let me see. Uh, we had a spider that was inside of our skull. There it is. You see it there, Tip? Uh, yeah, deep inside there. Okay, so there's a spider that has made a home of a skull. So even though this animal has died, it is still providing a home for a spider. And this is the perfect place for a spider to build its web because there's lots of places that it can attach its silk. And as little insects come to feed off the skin and all the bits of meat, so the spider can then grab it. Where is she? Oh, Cameron, you're wondering how many 
animals are endangered in South Africa. Now I'm not actually sure Cameron of the exact number of endangered species because there are many 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 endangered insects and moths and butterflies and spiders and scorpions that we don't really know about. Then there's also the reptiles, the mammals but there are quite a lot and unfortunately as the days go by and all and more and more people are born and taking up more space so more animals unfortunately are becoming more endangered. Now, unfortunately our spider is hidden and it's also just in time to say goodbye to all of you. I hope you've had a wonderful time with all of us. It's been so great having you with us and I hope you've learnt lots and you enjoyed us playing in the mud and seeing the warthogs and the elephants. It's been an absolute pleasure having you and for the rest of our viewers, we'll see you shortly. <laughs> So we continue on with our regular sunset safari and it's lovely to have all of our regular viewers on board as well. Of course, having schools with us is one of the most precious things that we do because educating the youth is of course the future of conservation and especially on a day like today, Endangered Species Day. Personally, I'm hoping for pangolin, but you never know on this particular Endangered Species Day. I think that might be wonderful. But don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag safari live on Twitter. I know that I asked some of you at the beginning of the sunset safari, before the schools or with the schools, while the schools were joined us, were with us, um, to send through what endangered species you'd like to see today. I'm not too fussy actually. It's a sad state of affairs that almost everything that we see is in some way, if not endangered, then at least threatened by human encroachment. So any animal that we see is a gift bird, insect, anything. Aaron, you say that you'd love to see the Cheetah Brothers and some vultures. It's been a long time since we've had a proper vulture sighting, isn't it? I agree with you on the Cheetah Brothers, by the way, but James is heading towards the east, so perhaps he'll get lucky and hear a report. It's about time for them to come back south. So I've been keeping my fingers crossed for the Cheetah Brothers appearance this afternoon. And vultures, I know. It's because, well, we haven't had many lions for well, the brief lion sightings that we've had. Very few of them have been on kills. And generally speaking, that's what's going to attract the vultures to this area. I did even hear a report, speaking of endangered raptor species, of black eagles flying around the Kruger. A pair of black eagles were spotted in the Kruger National Park. That's my absolute favorite raptor. It's my favorite bird species. Uh, I'm sort of hoping they might fly over us. You never know, they weren't that far away. I think they were near Orpen. Wouldn't that be a special surprise? Because those are cliff-based birds. I love that idea from Debbie in Vancouver. Now Debbie would like to know, because, well, would like us to share some rhino stories because we can't show rhino on these live safaris at this point. It's the policy of Wild Earth not to show them due to the poaching problem. But I, Debbie, I've always been all for talking about rhino. I don't believe we should pretend they don't exist. I'll tell you a story. I've got lots of rhino stories so we can spread them out over the entire safari because I spent a lot of time monitoring rhino. But I'll tell you a story about the other day when I was on, I was on air driving around a certain part of this reserve, chattering away just like I'm doing now, and out of the corner of my eye I saw this big grey bottom, and I thought, elephant! So I slammed on the brakes, I can't remember who was on camera with me, but they were sort of half prepared to swing off to the left, and then all of a sudden, as the camera started moving, I went, oopsie, and just put my foot down on the accelerator. And you don't know how often we do that. Framing up on something to avoid showing you the rhino. There was the time I came up through a dip and there was a rhino bottom in front of me in the road as bold as brass. I started talking about non-existent vultures up in the sky going look vultures I mean there's no vultures but there might have been I don't know and cameras up there Dave giggling in the back. We've all got fantastic rhino stories to share with you and I'm not going to monopolize all of your time on them because I'm sure Tristan has plenty of tales for you as well. 
Well, I do, Jamie, and rhinos probably are some of the most spectacular animals, and I've got probably, I don't even know how many stories that I could tell you about rhinos. I really, really love spending time around them. But there's probably two stories. One is from sort of when my time in Kenya, when I was part of, when I spent time at David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, and there was a rhino there at the time, a black rhino, and his name was called Shida. Now, Shida is a Swahili word for well, there's no delicate way to put it, but it's another word for dung, basically. And it was because he was probably the naughtiest rhino out there. And he had this game where he would love to chase people. And so what would happen was, this black rhino, when he was tiny and a little baby, it was quite funny because he used to kind of just jog around and people would laugh at him as he moved and as he kind of, you know, would chase after you. And when he's a small little 70 kilogram animal, not such a problem. He then started to grow and grow and grow and grow and eventually he got to a fully grown adult but his behavior did not change and so often you would just hear these yelping screams as visitors who were coming to see these baby elephants being raised back to the wild would be chased by this massive black rhino up into trees and often you'd find all the kids of the staff sitting in trees and this black rhino just looking up like asking why are you all running away from me I'm still playing and he would go crazy around the tree and eventually you'd have to call him and he would come away from it. Um, and then sometimes he used to come into the lounge itself and he used to go through these big open doors and then he would just go and park himself in the lounge as if he was part of the family and then would just sit there. It was quite amazing to see. And in terms of wild rhinos, I think the sighting that probably for me stands out and always will was a sighting of two white rhino bulls fighting. It was the most insane thing I've ever seen. We had tracked a rhino bull for quite a while and we were driving along and we got to this area where we could see his tracks were starting to run and you could see there was tracks for another rhino there and all of a sudden we came around the corner and these two rhino bulls came bursting out of the bushes and they cornered one against the tree and they started to fight with one another and eventually the one rhino picked the other one up now we're talking about massive fully grown bull rhinos the one picked the other one up completely off the ground shoved him against a tree and then they started to fight with one another horning each other and then they started to run at the car it was ridiculous we were trying to reverse people were trying to take photos but it just was the most insane sounds and the feeling of that sort of ground vibrating as these rhinos were running towards us was just something I'll never forget so it was really a very special experience. Seb, do you have a good rhino story? Not really. Uh, also fights, eh? Fighting Actually, rhinos. Yeah, yeah, yes. I think a lot of people will have those kind of stories of rhinos fighting. It is the most amazing thing and the sound that you get from that is just incredible. Right. We're not going to monopolize things, as Jamie says. I'm sure James will have a story for you a bit later. But let's go across to James, I mean Jamie, sorry, and see what she's up to and where she is and what her plans are for the afternoon and where she's going to be driving. James, I'm sure, will have plenty of stories to tell you, but unfortunately Rusty's being a bit recalcitrant this afternoon. But I'm sure James will manage to find signal and he'll have plenty of tales for you then. Now my plans, we'll carry on with story time in a moment, assuming I don't spot something intriguing along the way. My plan is apparently this morning on the Sunrise Safari, Tristan tells me that Tingana was walking towards Red Dam, but Shadow's tracks as well as that of her cub were around the same area. Now I'm making my way towards Red Dam in the singular hope that we're going to have three leopards in one sighting. Come here, spiderweb. There we go. Did I get it all? No, I didn't. And who's saying it's above my head somewhere? It's on my head. No, that's a piece of, no, that's a spiderweb. Um, okay. I think it's gone now. It's good now. It wasn't, it wasn't a spider web on the lens, it was a spider web on my hat. <laughs> Happens. But yes, we're going towards Red Dam. Who knows? Shadow and Cub and... Hello. Let's see if you stick around. Shadow, Cub and Tingana. How special would that be? I thought for a second this was a pile of elephant dung in the road. It is not. It is a little dwarf mongoose. Hello, little one. You look very lonely and alone. Where's the rest of your group? This is the same 
business of dwarf mongoose that we saw with Seb not too long ago, where the one kept hugging the branch for absolutely no perceivable reason. It was just having so much fun. Now, for our new viewers, this is a sociable species of mongoose. It's the smallest mongoose species. It's only a couple of hundred grams at the most. And I don't know why it's all alone. I suspect the rest of them are somewhere close by. What is it? Has it got something in its mouth there? No, my imagination. I thought for a second it maybe had a catch that it was just gearing itself up towards swallowing. It looks so poised and contemplative. What are you up to? Where's the rest of your family? Hmm. And while our dwarf Mont Montague, dwarf mongoose, contemplates its existence, let's go across to James, who's found signal and a hippopotamus. I have found signal and a hippo. There is the hippo and you can't see the signal because it's invisible. <laughs> now, Fergus and I were discussing a uh, rhino story and I thought how nice it would be to tell the rhino story in a manner of Michael Caine. So I thought I would say this is a story of Rodney the rhino. And Rodney, brothers to his mates, was a rhino that lived in the Great Akruga National Park. That's the only part I'm going to tell you in Michael Caine's voice. Let us return to the hippopotamus that is now rolling on its belly. Huge action here at Twin Dams. My rhino story... Um, well, do you want a serious rhino story or do you want an entertaining rhino story? You can tell us, hashtag Safari Live, if you want a serious rhino story or if you would like a jokeful rhino story, because I have a rhino joke and I also have a number of rhino stories. Oh, there's an ox pecker on the hippo. And I also was, apparently we were asked what our favourite endangered species are. And, well, given that my favourite animal here is endangered, and that is the wild dog, Justin, uh, well, I guess wild dogs must be my favourite endangered species. Uh, favourite endangered species that I haven't seen that I'd like to see has got to include something like a snow leopard and possibly a jaguar, although I'm not sure that they are necessarily endangered. Or would they be? They probably are, you know. Anyway, let's... I'm not sure we'll have signal. We should be okay. Let's carry on from here. This hippopotamus is not doing a great deal, and as we drive, I will tell you my rhino story. I'm going to go with the serious one. I will save the not-so-serious one for when we're driving around in the dark looking for that list of animals that all of you know off by heart by now. Um, my favourite rhino story... Um, well, I have a number, I suppose. I suppose my favourite rhino story probably comes from when I was, uh, you all met Byron of course, from when I was training Byron and some friends, we're going to stop here in the shade, we've run out of signal, and um, it's a short rhino story. We had a wonderful tracker, a little bit like Herbie, uh, called Solly, who's unfortunately passed away since then, but we tracked a rhino and we found it on foot and we went and we hid around a termite mound because we knew he was heading towards the termite mound to graze and in the summertime that's what rhino do, they go from mound to mound uh, looking for in the food, the, the grass that grows around the mounds because as we've discussed it's much uh, more nutritious around there. I'm just hearing some whistling behind me, it's a, it's a bird, but I don't know which bird. Anyway. What we did was we found the rhino, we saw where it was going, we snuck around and we got to this termite mound and it wasn't a termite mound that you could sit on top of. It was a termite mound that had vegetation sort of almost showering off it. And so we got underneath that vegetation and there we waited. And we checked the wind and we checked the wind and I looked at Solly and he put his thumbs up and we just waited and there were seven of us waiting there. And that rhinoceros came grazing up to that termite mound and at one stage his horn was no more than, say, a metre, that's three and a half feet, from my foot where I was sitting, leaning back against the mound like this. And nobody breathed at all as the rhino grazed around us. Then he turned, he came back again, then he turned, he came back again. 
and we were all looking at each other and I of course had to pretend that I was very confident in all of this and I knew exactly what was going on and we sat there probably for about 10 minutes with a rhino less than two meters from us and I suppose that would be my certainly one of my favorite rhino experiences thank you very much it's better than the story I made up in Michael Caine's accent as I was making my way I'm going to go across to Tristan he's going to tell you about but his favourite endangered species, I'm going to go to Chitwa Dam. Well, my favourite endangered species, James, this is a tough one because there are so many incredible ones around the world. I think obviously being here in Africa and being able to work with some of them would probably influence my favourite. I still struggle with this because in terms of a sort of value and a and just an amazing experience for me it would probably be the pangolin. The pangolin is just it doesn't feel like it belongs in this sort of time frame and in this sort of century it almost feels prehistoric and watching that animal move and listening to the scales rubbing as it does walk is just such an amazing thing and I remember the first time I saw a pangolin it almost took my breath away it was quite an amazing experience so I think for me sort of my favorite endangered animal is a pangolin and then closely followed by the wild dogs I think the wild dogs are just in terms of value for us as guides and and for people they they endear themselves by the, the way that they move around, the way that they are so sort of tight-knit as a unit and, the, and the, the sort of fact that they they just always entertaining, they're always up to something. So for me I think those two are, are the ones, but the pangolin just takes the cake from its rarity point of view. Well James, this is an interesting one because I actually don't know and the problem with pangolins is the, the lack of literature on them. There really is so little that's been written about a pangolin or said about a pangolin that we don't really know actually a lot of things. Well, I don't and, and my experience with pangolins is not huge. Um, I think there would probably be people out there that would be able to answer this but I'm not sure if a male or female is bigger. I would imagine that the male is slightly bigger but I could be completely wrong. Maybe James or Jamie does know. but. I'm not 100% sure. All well, the pangolins that I've seen, funny enough, they have been different sizes. So it is an interesting sort of thought. And what normally happens with pangolins is that when you see them, you get so excited that you completely just don't even think about reading up on all of these things. You take photos, you get back, and everyone's talking and going on with each other. And you kind of forget about the actual sort of learning experience about it. So I'll have to go and check and see and if I can't get back to you now. We're going to carry on towards this drainage line where there was these reports of these lion tracks and while we do that, let's go across to Jamie who's chasing his shadow. I'm chasing just one shadow. A shadow with a tiny miniature shadow by her side. And there are tracks of shadow and her cub walking along this road. These are obviously from this morning though, they're not fresh at all. And for our new viewers, shadow is a female leopard and she's got a Sure, how old is that cub now? One, two, three, four, almost five month old cub that I still have yet to see. Uh, we're really, really hoping that we're going to manage to find her for you on this sunset safari. Tracks have gone off straight, as Tristan said, towards Red Dam. So we're going to go and knock about around here and see whether we have any luck. This time of day, it's leopards, it's entirely possible she's wondering about. She could also have been taking the cub to a kill though, you never know. But this is the search that we're going to be conducting this afternoon. My favorite endangered species is a black rhino, but it's very hard to choose. Wild dog take a very close second, but it is very difficult to decide on one or the other. My favorite black rhino sighting ever was very similar to James's, except that the rhino knew that we were there and he walked right up to us. We were on foot. We weren't even on a termite mound. We had a, a big fallen tree in front of us. And he walked up to us and he looked at us because he was sleeping when we first found him. And he pressed his chin on the fallen tree. It was a young bull. So not at that age where hormones would be playing a big, a big feature in his life. He was only about four years old. And he put his head down on the fallen tree and then leant against a limb that was sticking up and he went to sleep. Standing up, dozing with me from, with us from here to the end of the bonnet away. 
was absolutely crazy and my heart was pounding initially when he walked up to us because I thought you know black rhino are notoriously unpredictable they do do very strange things but he wasn't interested and then when we moved out he followed us back to the car not aggressively just curiously what you doing where are you going I think he almost quite enjoyed the company they're strange creatures black rhino when I was a kid and I went to the Rhino Park, very young, I, I must have been about eight or so, I got to feed a black rhino called Buana at their rehabilitation center. And that was me done. That was rhino being my favorite animal from then on. Rebecca, yes, absolutely. It's one of the reasons why they can be quite short-tempered. Rhino indeed have quite bad eyesight. The calves, I've found in my experience, occasionally to my detriment, that the calves have better eyesight than the adults do. They are far better at spotting things. And I've found that a few times on walk, where there's been a rhino calf that's come not running towards us but walking towards us with its head up and its ears out very curious because it could see us and clearly mum couldn't which of course is always <laughs> you don't really want the little one to come walking up towards you when you're on foot you'd much rather be elsewhere but they are very short-sighted and that does tend to make them more unpredictable people always underestimate white rhino as well but white white rhino when they charge they charge properly this doesn't often happen but if you can't see something around you then you're more likely to be unpredictable much like elephants what was that I think it must have been a bird I just saw movement out of the corner of my eye So no tracks for our leopards popping out here. It looks as though someone's already driven here this afternoon. Remember how we used to find Shadow and Sindile here all the time? It was when Red Dam was almost completely dry and we'd find Sindile up in the drainage line somewhere around there. Here we go. Here is Red Dam. I'm just going to actually nosy on down, right down, just in case. Let's see if we can spot a leopard here. Because at this time of day, you can't make an assumption that just because you don't see it straight away, that there isn't one. So welcome to Red Dam. Red Dam is more green than red. And quite pungent. Is there a leopard hiding somewhere in the shadows? Is Shadow hiding somewhere in the shadows? I'm going to keep searching the edge of the waterhole. Perhaps we get lucky. But James has had a similar idea and is with a large bird of prey at Chitra Dam. Yes, we do have a large bird of prey here at Chitra Dam. And there was something of vital importance I was going to say. Oh yes, I was totally distracted because I was looking at pangolin masses. Because we were asked, I'm not going to talk about the, that bird of prey just yet. We were asked uh, if pangolins have different masses, male and female. And they do. You will find that a female is almost half the size of a male. So average male mass from a sample size of 36, that's quite big for this thing here. Um, is 13.3 kilograms. So you can multiply that by 2.2, .2, you get to just under 30 pounds, that's for a male. And for a female, about 7.4 kilograms. And that is roughly 20 pounds, I guess. No, 18 or so. So that fish eagle looking inevitably for fish, it will take small goslings, it will of course take, uh, what else would it take, it would take, um, what's going on here, 
at this. It's a drongo chasing a green-backed heron. There goes the green-backed heron. Well done, Fergus. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Sorry, I was just confused slightly there. And the other thing the fish eagle will take is carrion. They're not shy of eating the meal that something else has caught. I was rather hoping for the great bevy of elephants that were here yesterday. But alas, we don't seem to have any of that here right now. I will tell you that Tandi was seen crossing onto Cheetah Plains earlier today. And so we will head across that way after we have observed what there is here at the dam. Now this is quite cool, Ferg. Um, can you go to the, that sort of middle block of nests there? Where the pseudo goose is. There, to the right. That one there. That's the one. And yes, that one. There's a pseudo goose with its head buried inside. Now, if you go up from the pseudo goose, you will see a white thing. And it is my firm belief that that white thing is an egg. A goose egg that has fallen out of that. Remember that nest we had at the very top, everybody, during the January, February TV shows? There was a nest on top of that lot there. And two or three, or in fact there were 12 eggs that did not hatch there. And I think that that is one of those eggs that's obviously f fell, fallen down, fell, 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 fallen down. It's called a pseudo goose, of course, because it's not a goose, it is a duck. And um, as Fergus called it a pseudo goose, and I thought it was quite nice. An Egyptian pseudo goose. There it flies. They want to avoid the deeper water to swim in because that's where a crocodile will grab them. <laughs> Look at that ridiculousness. Deborah, you say is that one of the one of their nests below where the fish eagle is perched? No, I think that's another red billed buffalo weaver's nest. But that's not to say the goose would not sit on top of that and nest there, because they do that. And in fact, two or three of the nests that we've seen from the Egyptian ghouls in this area have been on top of the red-billed buffalo weaver's nests. I'm still scanning the clearings on either side to see if perhaps there won't be some kind of elephant arrival. But at the moment, alas, nothing. But one alarm calling in parlor. Everything else looking very chilled. Hello, Chris. You're wondering if the fish eagle is similar to the American bald eagle. It is very similar. It's in the same genus. So yeah, they are very similar. American bald eagle is bigger, quite a lot bigger, but they are very similar indeed. More than that, I can't really tell you because I don't know a huge amount about the American bald eagle, I'm afraid. The national bird, I think, of the United States of America. There are some nyalas. One male on the left, one female on the right. Let me just check out what genus that is, Chris. There is an attempt at alarm calling going on that I don't think you'll be able to hear. It's quite far in the distance, but it's really not very serious and nothing else is having a go. So I think it's probably not, it's almost certainly nothing. Aaron, that's interesting. You say, do fish eagle hunt on the coastlines as well? They don't, well, they do on, on the, in the coastal estuaries, they do, but not in the sea. 
They absolutely do not hunt in the sea. Sorry, I'm just listening to the radio. No, nothing. Uh, and, and so where I live, or where my home is now, and where my parents live, in a place called the Eastern Cape, there's an estuary, there are two estuaries there, and there are fish eagles all the way up the rivers, but they don't go into the sea. And of course I was reminded that you get sea eagles in various parts of the world, including Europe, and certainly in India there were sea eagles. Anyway, the genus of the bald eagle and the African eagle is Haliatus, Haliatus. and uh, you spell that like this, H-A-L-I-A-E-E-T-U-S. Uh, I've never seen or heard of so many vowels in a row ever. One, two, three, four of them in a row, Haliaitis. I think that's the same as the bald eagle. Alrighty, we're going to press on from here. We might pass back here a little while later, see if something's coming down to drink. We're going to see if we can't pick up on Shadow, not Shadow, Tundi, but we'll, we'll see what else we can find. In the meantime, Tristan is going to tell you something entertaining. Well, good luck, James. I hope you do find Tundi. She's been a bit scarce of late, and I wonder how her and Tumbo are doing. But we've come all the way up to the north western corner and we're trying to see if little dwarf mongoose will come out and see if we're not something to be investigated. They're just sitting in this little middle island on the road and I was hoping that they were going to start coming and just seeing who we are. They are really getting quite curious and you can see little heads popping up above the grass every now and then just to check who we are and they, I'm hoping that they are going to come out onto the road itself. The thing with dwarf mongoose is if you just sit for a while and you just take it very very easy they do start to relax and they do then start to come out and kind of see who you are and what you are and whether or not you are a threat and so I'm hoping now that we've lowered our profile and we're not walking that they will come out. Now the reason why like I said we were going to head up into this northwestern corner is because there were reports that there was tracks for two females going in and out of a drainage line and I have a sneaky suspicion that it could be for amber eyes and that younger female and I'm hoping just maybe that maybe one of them has cubs so we've come up here just to make sure and check if that is the case if not then well it will have just been a good afternoon's exercise but it's worth making sure and checking there they come so John you're wondering if there's a social structure amongst the mongoose there comes one down the road you see it Seb yeah. there we go isn't that cool so John yes there is there is particularly in these sort of dwarf mongoose groupings or in the banded mongoose groupings you'll get an alpha male and an alpha female and it is very strict they will be the ones that control what goes on and it's amazing structure that they have particularly the way that they will determine who is the alpha female or male let's say one of them gets killed by a predator they'll then find that they'll have to be this kind of sort of fight if you want to call it that for dominance and instead of them trying to bite each other and wrestle each other like a lot of the other animals would do these guys will groom one another and so basically what happens is they groom each other and they'll lick each other and lick each other until one becomes so exhausted and so dehydrated from lack of moisture and saliva that it's now spread all over the other one that it then gives up and that one then takes over as the dominant individual which is quite amazing sometimes you'll see photos of them that they'll actually be completely wet almost looks like they've been dunked in a bucket of water in this fight over dominance so really interesting way that they establish it but yes there definitely is a very dominant structure in the slender mongoose and the white-tailed mongoose it's more a pair and the males will then fight for a territory which will then encompass a female and they'll keep their female for as long as they're possible so that's how it kind of works with the male and females of the singular mongoose or the pair mongoose in these grouping mongoose there's an alpha male and an alpha female now it seems like they might have disappeared into some holes in the ground so I think we're probably going to carry on and see if we can't get into that area where those lion tracks were and find things to look at or find tracks that would be quite nice <laughs> and like I say if we get lucky and we actually find these tracks, wouldn't it be amazing to find a den site for the Inkohumas again? It's been so long that we've had them around here regularly that it would be really, really special if we did. Now, the den area, if it is around, would be somewhere in this block off to our left-hand side between the sort of gate, Simambili, Arethusa cut line and us here on Buatella. So that's why we're heading in this direction. I want to just check and there was lots of vocalizing coming from this area last night. So we want to just try and see if they're not in here somewhere. 
but it is the most beautiful afternoon. Seb and I were actually saying that it's a lot warmer than we thought it would be. I was actually going to go out to the Jersey at one point, but there is no wind this afternoon. And Seb is laughing at me because, yeah, you know, Seb, that would have been a very bad idea. I'm now very happy that you gave me trouble for it and that I took it off because it is very warm out here this afternoon. The wind's completely gone, the sun feels warm. It actually feels like a sort of early spring afternoon rather than us going into winter. So a lovely temperature out here. But I think let's head into the bush now and see what we can go and find. Right, so let's see what is inside this thicket and what awaits us. And while we do that, I believe Jamie is on Arethusa and still on her search for shadow. Standard viewer demographic. Oh, hello. And we continue on. I'm sorry, I think I lost compl I lost comms completely there. So you came all came as a bit of a surprise to me being on the back of our vehicle. I need to learn to contain the surprised expression on my face. Craig and I were doing a TV rehearsal just before we did the Mother's Day shows and I pulled my earpiece out by mistake and Craig had to be the one to tell me that I was live but Craig's quite soft-spoken so I turned to hear what he was saying and then realized we were live and we sat in the review afterwards and watched my facial expression and then rewound and watched it again the look of pure shock and horror on my face was highly entertaining for all myself included okay so the search for shadow continues She's a difficult leopard to find, and there's been a lot of vehicle traffic around here. I might come back to Red Dam a bit later. When it's a little bit cooler, the chances of leopards moving about are higher. It's a leopard, so you never know. They could be moving at any time of the day. I wonder where we should check. It's, it's very hard to pick up tracks when there have been lots of vehicles around. And otherwise, Arethusa is so quiet at the moment. Lou, can I just test that I've still got comms with you? Oh, there we go. Got you. Our Lionheart Lightwood, I think, is what I heard, but I could be wrong. Lionheart, you want to know if we know for certain Light works, light works, sorry, light works, not light wood. I was thinking like marula wood or something. Um, you want to know if we know for certain that Shadow's cub is a female. I honestly haven't seen her, so I can't confirm with absolute certainty. I think most of the guides have come to the conclusion that it is a female. Mm. Oh, it's a hyena track, that's what it is driven over hyena track. I'm still looking for Tingana's tracks. Most of the guides seem to have reached that conclusion and of course some of the guides from Arethusa, Simabili, the areas outside of where we can traverse, they will have a far better idea because they would have seen Shadow more, especially as she spent quite a bit of time on Hoffman's, which is to the south of our traverse area. And they seem to be relatively comfortable with the fact that it's a female. Um, I don't want to really give you false information, so I don't want to exactly, see, you know, without seeing her, I don't want to say for absolute certain, but I think James has seen her, and see, he seemed to be quite certain that it was a female. Am I wrong about that, or... My understanding was James seemed to think it was a female. That we'll just have to find it, and find out be so wonderful to see it especially just before I go to Kenya and having having not seen it before this must have been where Tingana was oh sorry Craig could we have a look at the birds up there instead we'll get back to the off-road tracks they're not going anywhere but the birds might be a family of white crested helmet shrikes and then a little bit to the left is a black-headed oriole. We arrived right in the middle of a bird feeding party. All right, from feathered things to something scaled, James has found you a very large lizard. 
Yes, we have a lovely picture there of some sand. Unfortunately, there was a very large water monitor. We'll show you something else in the water rather then. There was a water monitor just scuttled down below the bank there. Let's go and... Oh, there's the Egyptian goose. It is actually walking towards the water monitor. It's a great big mystery. Look how surprised they look. <laughs> That's very cool. You can see that very strange, very strange eye markings which I think is what gives them the name Egyptian Goose. Apparently they look a little bit like a pharaoh. Hello, our beard. You're wondering if the Egyptian Goose is really a duck. It is really a duck. I'm not entirely sure, of course, all the differences between geese and ducks. One of them, I believe, is the ability to perch. Now, although the Egyptian goose is able to sit in a tree, it doesn't have that um, mechanism in its feet where it is able to perch. What have you got there, Ferg? Another goose. Another goose. Shall we have a quick look at the crocodilo? As we hope desperately for some elephants to come down, but I don't think they're going to. You see the crocodile there? There he is. Look at him, he's very cleverly covered himself in some green makeup for the afternoon. He's um, put that very beautiful, I think, lime green algae all over his body. And there he waits in dastardly fashion for something to go past uh, that he will devour. Yeah, Thad, you asked a very good question. You say, is a water monitor the same thing as a Nile monitor? Thad, it absolutely is. You're correct. It's the same thing. In the same way that the rock monitor is known as a tree monitor sometimes, or just a legavan, uh, it is the same thing. And that crocodile looks to be in absolute bliss. Floating on a pleasant afternoon thinking about the catfish he ate this morning, possibly considering something larger if it comes down to drink, but of course being a reptile, having no real desperate need to eat anything for, you know, up to two years at a time. And so he's just chilling to the max. He's pleased with his makeup that he's made for himself. And the only thing he's thinking is, you know what I could do with here, some ladies. I don't think there are any ladies around for me. I might have to go down to the Sand River and fight it out with the other big bull crocodiles. But for now, I'll just stay here and float gently. <laughs> now, I believe Tristane would like to show us Herbert's very favourite endangered animal. It's not those pigs. I don't know what it is. Let's go and find out. Right, so Herbie, your favourite endangered animal, which is from Katie. So what, do you, what is your favourite? My... Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite endangered uh, in Mali is a wild dog. So you're another one of the wild dog. That means out of the four of us so far, well presenter wise, that's three, four wild dogs and one with a black rhino. So Herbie, wild dogs is a good one. I, I agree with you. And what did you spot Herbie? I saw you pointing to something just now. Ah, over there. Well spotted. Ah, look at this. Herbie's on form. So Seb, if you come around this way and we'll try and show you what Herbie has spotted. So over here, I don't know if you can see, but underneath the leaves, there are some legs that are sticking out. Now, you must imagine that Herbie has seen this from probably, I would say, three, four meters away. And now we're right up against it. It's very, very, very sort of obscured. But there's one leg, there's another. And on the underside of this particular plant, which I'm going to try and see if I can just bend slightly because I don't want to break its web. But let me go. There we go, Seb. Is that better? Yeah. 
All right, so we're just trying to get the exposure. There we go. So there is a beautiful garden orbweb spider. So how Herbie has spotted that, I'm not quite sure. It's in the shade. It's not easy to see, and it is really, really difficult. But he's once again pulled out all the stops, and what a beautiful specimen it is. It's one of these large females. Now I'm going to try just go down a little bit because I'm shaking too much. So Seb, is that okay? Is that better? Sorry, Seb. Isn't that shaky? <laughs> well, my my hands tend to shake a little bit, so it's not That's great right. when it comes to holding insects and things like that. But you can see she's sort of facing away from us. Now the reason why she's probably in there is because in her web she's managed to catch something. You see here? Look, she's got a little grasshopper that's all been wound up together and so she's injected that venom. She's then wrapped it in its silk. Isn't that amazing? And because of the backlight we can actually see the shape of the grasshopper there. That's absolutely incredible. And so now what she's doing, she waits for the venom to act to break down the insides of that particular grasshopper and then she can come down her web and basically suck up all the juices that are inside there and feed off that little grasshopper. And once it's finished, what you'll find is she'll actually take the bits of that grasshopper and she'll sew it or silk it into her web and she'll make a sort of line with it. And there's actually, you see that crisscross thicker silk that you've got there? She'll build that into there and it will become part of her stabilimentum and part of her display play to other animals to please not break her web and go after it. But that is insanely cool. Generally when they wrap them up in silk you actually can't see too much because they do such a good job. But because the light is coming from behind it, we can actually see how those legs and everything are wrapped. And it's amazing how good a job they actually do. Very, very cool. Well done girl. That's a very, very clever. Now I don't see any males around or any of the dewdrop spiders, but what we did have just now in the on another piece of grass was a different type of orb web spider. So I've seen these before and I was trying to do some research on them and there's really very little that I can actually find out other than the fact that they are part of the angulate orb web. So it's just sitting here on the edge of the grass but it's got the most beautiful abdomen. You see it's got this kind of like copper line that goes over highlighted by white and then this sort of creamy colored abdomen that helps it just blend into that grass with the stripy legs. Isn't that amazing? You can see it's got a much smaller web than what you see on the golden orb web spider. Very, very cool indeed. Now, I wonder where its web actually extends to because it seems like it's just here. So I wonder if it's not, this is just the casing that it's going to be making for eggs. It looks like it almost could be. I wonder if this thing is still busy with its webbing and trying to actually build a casing. Now it's going to have to be very, very careful because if it so for some reason sends out a parachute string of silk and it ends up going towards this orb web spider and falls into that web, she could potentially prey onto it. It's a much, much bigger spider than what this angulate orb web is and so it would be probably an easy meal for that orb web spider. So well done. Well, not well done. You better be careful, girl. This is not very, very good positioning that you've made at all. You can't choose your neighbors though, so sometimes you have to just make do. But very, very cool. Amazing. It just shows you that sometimes when you actually stop and you look around, there's so much life around you. And I wonder how often we actually just walk without seeing things because sometimes we kind of walk blindly and often on these bushwalks we start getting into these most in-depth discussions about many things. Now we were talking about lions and we actually were talking about Herbie celebrating a time he found the Inkahumas and the Birminghams until they decided that he was not really welcome and they started actually going at him and then he said that his celebration ended rather quickly and he tried to get out of there so it's kind of we delve into these things and we actually forget that around us is just all this beauty and these little things that we can pick up and often from the vehicle we also forget the same thing and that's why bushwalk is just so amazing and to be able to do it as a guide is so special now I was going to go round a thicket, but I think it would have been quite difficult for Seb to keep visual of me, so I'm going to carry on. You can hear the grey go-away birds are calling at us, and so while they do that, let's go across to Jamie, who I think would hope a grey go-away bird would call and reveal Shadow's location. I hope so indeed, for all of our sakes, but until the grey go-away bird calls, Let's see what else we can find. I'm going to go back towards Red Dam a little bit later, just in case these leopards pop out there. It's very hard to figure out exactly where they've gone. Their tracks don't come out of the block. There's no fresh tracks there. Oh, we'll try a little bit later. Apparently, they lost when they lost Tingana this morning, he was still on the move. So it's hard to predict exactly where he's going to have vanished to. Oh, but we do have something else to show you. 
Let's see if we can get sneak up a little bit closer to them. The heroes of our live safaris recently have been hippos, elephants and warthogs. There have been so many warthogs around. I'm happy about that. And there's a big sow and her two piglets. Hello guys. I don't suppose you know where the leopards are, hmm? I know Tingana for one loves to search for warthogs. He's even been seen going down warthog burrows to pull out piglets. But I wouldn't want to mess with that female. She is fully mature. She's actually quite an old cow. Sow. Not cow. Sow. Judging from the size of her tusks. She's quite a big girl. And you can see the bottom tushes as well. Not quite as large as her top set of tusks, but far, far sharper. And somebody's been enjoying a day at the spa, by the looks of your skin, madam. She's been rolling about in mud. You can see her fur all matted at the top. She's quite a deep, dark brown colour. Snuffling in the roots. There's the little ones off to the right. Oh, she's actually got more than two. I didn't realise. There's a couple of them over there. Lionheart Lightworks, you say that you love warthogs and that they make you so happy when you see them because you think they're adorable. I'm glad that you do because I also really love warthogs. I find them imminently entertaining. There's something adorable about their features. Everyone talks about them as being ugly. I don't think they're ugly at all. I think they're very sweet. And you have that in common with a previous director who used to work for Safari Live, Tara. And every time we put a warthog on camera, Tara would instantly light up. You could hear her excitement through the radio. She was speaking to us. It was back in the day when I first started working here and to get a warthog sighting was a mission. They were so skittish in the beginning. I don't know what it is that's changed. We had to either come to Arethusa Airstrip or go towards the Arethusa Dam to see warthogs. They were the only relaxed sounders that we knew of. And now we've got them everywhere. We've even got a family that lives on quarantine and that we see each and every day. My dog Lexi once made friends with a warthog. Friends is perhaps a strong term. She got chased by a warthog. Ooh, Leo, very good question. And I'm saying that because I have absolutely no idea what the answer is. Leo wants to know if warthogs are ever born without tusks in the same way that elephants are. Because, of course, for our new viewers, I know all of our regular viewers know this fact, but about around about, naturally, 4% of elephants, African elephants, are born without their tusks. It's a natural thing. I don't think so. I'm sure there must be a member or two of the population that's without tusks, but I have never ever seen a warthog without tusks. Not once. And these little piglets are at the age, they must be about six months old now, so they're almost at the point where they're going to start growing their tusks. It's still a bit too soon. You can just see them poking through just a little bit. I always wonder if the growth of the tusks must be uncomfortable. Thank you, little one. That was a lovely view you gave us. Um, I always think that it must, they must get teething pains beyond what we experience as children when those tusks poke through. Bra imagine breaking through the upper lip. They must rub and be uncomfortable initially. I wonder. I bet it isn't comfortable. But I don't know. I've never ever seen a warthog without tusks. I've seen a warthog with broken tusks. I've seen a warthog with small tusks but I've never ever seen one without them. Hmm, interesting question. I'm thinking about it. Because of course tusks are modified teeth, for those of you that are unfamiliar with that concept. Just as elephant teeth are, or elephant tusks are modified teeth, so warthog tusks are as well. And there's a skull in the tent that gives a really clear demonstration of where the teeth or the tusks slot into the jaw, into the upper jaw and the lower jaw. Do you think it would be, no, 
it's not really like human beings born without wisdom teeth, is it? Because we don't need our wisdom teeth anymore. But warthogs will always need their tusks. As long as they live out here with lions and leopards, they will need those tusks to defend, e defend themselves. I don't know. That's a very good question. I'm going to go and do some research and find out. Ali, despite what the Lion King may lead you to believe, no. Warthogs won't really eat insects. <laughs> I'm sure every now and again while they're snuffling up their food, they might eat the odd ant or the odd grasshopper, perhaps, that's not very quick. But warthogs won't go and snuffle around like Pumba did and then swallow large grubs. They don't really actively seek them out. You might find that if they found a, a dung beetle grub, say for example sitting in front of them right next to the grass that they're grazing on they might eat it because all animals out here even the herbivores will supplement their diet in times of sort of nutritional distress during a drought or something like that which is why you get stories of bush pig warthog all sorts of creatures nibbling off carcasses it's just to supplement their diet now to say never is a tricky one because never say never out here but there's absolutely no part of their diet that is based on insects or bugs. They don't eat bugs. They are pure herbivores. There are certain recorded cases. There was that very strange incident where a warthog killed an impala lamb. That was really odd though. And I mean that was, if I remember correctly, that was during the beginnings of the drought. So again, nutritional distress makes animals do strange things when their system is really under pressure. And I have 